G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy, and today we are continuing our series of going through every individual AFL team and doing a video pro profiling them, talking about their off-season, how 2023 went, potentially projecting how 2024 is going to go, and I have a crack at their best 22 and analyze some uh, list strengths and weaknesses, I suppose, overall. So, uh, like I said, I've been doing uh, this in reverse alphabetical order. I started with the Western Bulldogs. Uh, I've done GWS earlier today on the channel, and today is the Gold Coast Suns. And uh, if you want to find that content in a very specific place, you can go to a playlist on the channel called Club-Based Videos for 2024, uh, or else you can just find it in the most recent uh, uploads on this particular channel. So before I crack into the uh, Gold Coast Suns list, if you could do me a favor and subscribe to the channel for more AFL content and also some cricket content coming up this summer. Great, let's talk about the Gold Coast Suns. Uh, they are always a kind of interesting sort of project to oversee because they haven't really had a lot of success, it has to be said. It is another year in 2023 uh, where they fail to hit their own expectations, uh, which is to get nudged closer and closer into the finals race. And at times they were kind of there, but at the end of the day, they're end of the year in the bottom four. There is a sense that potentially now, uh, like there has been the sense before, there might be light at the end of the tunnel with the new coach, Damien Hardwick, which I do think is a legitimate reason for optimism. And there is also a lot of young talent on this team that is starting to emerge as genuinely good players. So while 2023 was not really an on-field success other than some strong individual performances, perhaps one day it will be reflected upon as the season that happened to happen, the one where Damien Hardwick got prized loose of Richmond. Well, not prized loose, obviously. He uh, he parted ways with Richmond, but it was the year where they decided to part ways with Dew and uh, have ended up with one of the best coaches of the modern era. So there's genuine cause for optimism in that space, I would suggest. But the Gold Coast Suns, again, another team that was a little bit Jekyll and Hyde this year. Um, you know, going into the last four rounds of the season, they were in the finals race, which is important to remember. It was just that that part of the ladder was also quite even, and they did... Um, endure a pretty disappointing end to the season. They were up and down. I think there was only one occasion where they won back-to-back -back games. And like I said, lost the last four games of the season as they had a bit of a tough run home, it has to be said. There were some good performances there. You know, they smashed the Brisbane Lions in the Q Clash. I think they beat St Kilda as well. And, um, you know, on the bright side, there was a lot of positive individual performances. In a year where Took Miller as well lost, uh, well, he missed like half a year with a meniscus, I think it was. We saw Noah Anderson uh, have his best career season. We saw the return of Ben King. He kicked 40 goals, which is a pretty good return season. Jack Lakosius moved forward, kicked 39 goals, including winning a few games off his own boot three bags of five in fact it was Sam Flanders also emerged as a potentially good primary on baller going forward but you know particularly when it came to the midfield there was a sense of too few doing too much uh, with Anderson and Rao and Fl Flanders obviously having good seasons um, you know the, the absence of Took Miller really hurt them and uh, at the end of the day it, it saw them finish in the bottom four so let's uh, talk about the list changes that they uh, underwent underwent this year in terms of players who left the club first they had a bit of a clean out it has to be said so Marby Ochoal uh, joined uh, he was kind of forecasted and probably not getting too many opportunities next year I suppose the recruitment of uh, Jed Walter is a factor in that Elijah Hollands went to Carlton Chris Burgess went to Adelaide Jeremy Sharp was delisted and then ended up at Fremantle. We've also got Jed Anderson, Brody O'Loughlin, Charlie Constable, Connor Blakely retired, and Jake Steen. In terms of players who joined the club, uh, Walter, Reed, Rogers, and Graham all went in the first round of the academy, um, or through the academy system in this year's draft. Then they drafted Jack Marnie from North Melbourne through the rookie draft, and Sam Closey as well from the VFL, who I think was awarded the most promising young player in the VFL this year. So um, yeah, a big clean out there of players uh, who were probably not going to be contributing to the club going forward, probably saved a little bit of money as well, uh, cleaned off a little bit of salary cap as well as adding some real top tier talent. In particular, Jed Walter is arguably right behind Harley Reid or even level in some people's eyes as the most talented kid in this year's draft. So from that sense, a really positive off season in a way, just you know, clearing a few uh, unnecessary players off the books, probably shedding a fair bit of experience, but experience that might not have really come in handy anyway. And then adding some real top tier talent, but not only top tier, but local top tier talent. It's probably one of the best off seasons uh, the Gold Coast Suns have ever seen. So with that all in mind, I've had a crack at uh, predicting their best 22. Maybe not predicting because at the end of the day, as we know, best 22s are idealistic and, and you know there's never really a, cha a chance of no injuries occurring. But I've gone with a conservative 22 and what I mean by that is I haven't got any new players on the list so I haven't picked any of their draftees um, which you know might not be a reflective of reality but uh, this is the 22 that I went with. So starting from the defense there, 
I do like the back three talls. Ballard, you know, a bit of an underrated gun. Sam Collins, obviously, has been a good player for a while. And Mac Andrew now is, is kind of developing as that key back. So I think those are the three best key back options that they have on the list. In general, though, I don't see a settled defense. Like, I think there's a bit of competition for spots, a few unheralded players there. Not a lot of real top-end talent in terms of medium running types or anything like that. I picked Butterick, Jeffrey, and McPherson. Um, I have picked Will Powell on a wing because of uh, Lockie Neal's ACL. He's going to be unavailable uh, for, I think, the first half of the year. Forgive me if I'm wrong on that, but I, he's not going to be available round one. So I think Will Powell has the attributes to push up into a wing. So I picked McPherson down back. I picked Ben Long. But there's a few options that I'll get to as well. Um, Brandon Ellis takes the other wing. The midfield top three, you know, it's a pretty strong uh, trio with Miller, Rowell, and Anderson. And I've picked Flanders on the bench. I, I could have put Flanders on a flank here, but I wanted to indicate that I think he should be playing his football as a, as a genuine on-baller going forward. He's probably going to spend some time on a flank because he has that versatility. But I saved the flanks for Ainsworth and Humphrey. Humphrey is going to be a uh, you know, player to watch again this year, you'd think. Pretty physically ready-made and could seriously take another step this year as well. In the small small fourth spot, I put Roses Jr. with Holman on the bench as the bench defender. What I do like about this team is uh, Lukosius and King as a uh, as a key forward duo is, is very dangerous. And you've got Jed Walter waiting in reserve. So I did go with Levi Kasbolt. I just think, you know, he had a pretty productive year last year. And he also sort of serves to be that second ruck. Could Jed Walter take his spot in round one of next year, I think it's entirely possible. And, and I would be tempted to play Jed Walter in round one because he's very ready-made. So I'll, I'll defer to the Suns fans on what they think about that. But Casbolt did sort of earn uh, a spot in the 22, I think, with last year being a fairly good year. Jared Witts is also a pretty underrated ruckman. Uh, very, very prolific with his hitouts. Um, I've gone with Alex Davies as the sub as well. But we'll talk about some players that I left out of here. Like I said, first of all, the draftees. Jed Walter could play round one. Jake Rogers is probably not far off being ready to play round one. It's just uh, I couldn't fit him in. I think their medium forward types are fairly strong. Um, maybe he could come in for Holman, but I think Holman is the best 22 player at the moment. Uh, in terms of defenders, you know, there's Jai Farrar, uh, Will Graham as well, another draftee who could potentially play in the back. The only draftee I think that's probably not going to play next year is Ethan Reid. Sam Closey as well, he's relatively ready-made, probably needs to put on a bit of size, but he's another running defender option that they've got there. Ned Moyle would be their backup ruckman. Um, then there's a few mature players that I've left out of this team. Specifically, Braden Fiorini, Rory Atkins, uh, Sam Day, Alex Sexton, and Sean Lemon's a little bit unlucky uh, in, in that. But that's the way I see their best 22. But of course, this is an, an outsider, a non-Gold Coast fan trying to have a crack. So I am certainly going to be open to your comments in the comment section. I think the wing question will be an interesting one this year in the absence of Weller. Like I said, I put Will Powell there because I think with his running carry, he has the potential to be an impact player in that way. Could Ainsworth uh, push up potentially as well? One other, you know, maybe a weakness is a genuine small forward. I think what we've seen of Roses Jr. was pretty strong. Like he, he does look like a pretty good talent, but um, is there another top end small forward that they could bring in? Maybe an Isaac Rankin. But going forward, you know, I think it's going to be critical to keep someone like a Ben King on this list, which I think is the most obvious redundant thing I could have said in this video. But just think about a trio of Jed Walter, Matt, uh, Ben King, and Jack Lacocious. I think that is really damaging and I think could potentially be the best trio of forwards in the competition one day. So in terms of addressing the, the ongoing needs, what I think they need, I think that there probably is that lack of quality wing options, like I said, unless Power can really make that spot his own. Um, they're probably at the position now with their list that they would probably be on the market for established quality, but acquiring established quality through trade or free agency obviously has not been easy for the Gold Coast Suns. Um, maybe another thing, a small quality forward, like I said, Roses Jr. could be that player. So uh, we'll see what happens there. Interestingly as well, I just noted that there's a lot of experienced aging players out of contract next year. So we could see another little clean out for them. Um, guys like Sexton, Lemons, Day uh, are three players there that could potentially move on. But again, as an outsider trying to assess it. Like I said, though, the, the, in terms of list management, their biggest focus this year will be keeping Ben King um, and because he becomes a restricted free agent. So... I would love to think that he stays. That was my desired outcome. And I do think the, the, the possibility that Hardwick comes in and establishes belief that they're actually going somewhere could be pretty pivotal in that. And I, I do think, you know, it's probably more than 50-50 that that happens. But other than that, you know, in terms of like drafting for talent, I think, you know, 
they've drafted pretty well in recent times, obviously aided by the academy system, of course. But I think when Damien Hardwick came in, in his press conference, he suggested that the premiership list that Gold Coast are ideally striving for, you know, it's a lot of that team, if not all of it, is already on the list. It's just about nurturing it and getting the next part right because that's never... The, the, the access to talent, drafting the right kids per se, has probably not been their weakness. It's been, you know, for a start developing them and then retaining them as well. So I think the advent of a lot of local players being you know suddenly injected into this team like walter reed etc i think he's enormously positive so the outlook for 2024 with this team is um you know when we reflect on 2023 i think given how much responsibility sort of lay at the feet of a lot of young players still like raul anderson flanders they're all like 2019 draft i think all three of them i mean just an example there you know lacocious and king are only a year older uh, if i've got that right uh, there still was a lot of a burden on some young players that haven't hit their prime yet so the falling in a heap at times was probably pretty forgivable you would say and then the return of took miller to this team i think will be pretty critical i do believe that on best 22 quality this team is a finals chance it has to be said i probably thought that last year which probably might have been a little bit premature but when you consider the development we saw from like guys like anderson um and you know flanders and and ben king and lacocious as well i think as well the return of ben king kicking 40 goals is enormously positive you're never really sure the year after an acl how that works so if i had to forecast you know the the short-term future I, i think we could see a similar first year um, to Adam Kingsley, maybe not exactly like that. I don't think the Gold Coast will go to a prelim or anything like that. What I mean is a tale of two halves. I think it could take some time for Hardwick to really optimize a game plan for this particular list. It's not going to happen overnight. We could see them start out of the block slowly and potentially end the year really well. And I would say that 2025 should be the year that they make finals. It probably won't happen in 24, but I could be wrong. And that, uh, that best 22, particularly that midfield, could explode you know maybe right now on quality it's not quite there but the potential rating is high which means that it could happen on any given day and i would bet on it more likely being in 2025 than 24 but that's probably just down to how long it takes of hard week to really get the best out of this group so you have it guys that is my uh attempt at an analysis of the gold coast suns uh obviously there's some real quality on that list it's just about retaining them for a start and developing in the right way and you do think that you know, when Hardwick went to Richmond, the Richmond Football Club was on its knees. Like, they were a basket case, for not just in the short term, but, you know, over a number of years. And he completely, along with the help of others, completely changed that culture. And I think, similar to North Melbourne here with Clarkson, you think the right guys at the helm. So you have a bit more faith in them actually getting their act together. So I'm hopeful for it. I would like to see a strong Gold Coast Sun side this year. And, uh, you know, I hope they make the finals. But let me know in the comments, guys, what you agree with and disagree with. What do you think are the strengths and weaknesses of this Gold Coast uh, side and list, I suppose? I hope you're enjoying the content. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And I'll see you in the next video, guys. Cheers.